Thank you everybody for coming. This tour bug session focused on uh, pangenomics. My name is Dustin Sokolowski. I am the uh, introductory trainee and the first speaker for today. Um, so I guess to introduce myself. Oh, sorry. What? Oh, sure. So to introduce myself, I've been at UFT for quite a while. Um, I started my PhD with Dr. Mike Wilson in 2017 um, and finished this past November where I focused on developing, but thanks, um, can get out, focused on developing bioinformatic tools, uh, particularly um, focusing on RNA sequencing, bioinformatic tools to help understand complex processes like postnatal development. Um, now I'm doing a postdoc with uh, Jared Simpson, um, as well as Melissa Holmes at UTM to look at um, assembling and annotating this really wonderful group of animals called African mole rats. And today I'm gonna to be talking about my work um, with the naked mole rat. Um, so, yeah. So, I think, oh, num, sorry, just make sure the slide changed. Okay. So, I think a number of people are sort of at least tangentially aware of the naked mole rat. Um, at least they know that these animals are really, really strange. They have this incredible suite of unique adaptations. Um, and we were introduced by Melissa Holmes, who's now my postdoc advisor, um, a number of years ago in 2018 to try and understand um, some molecular underpinnings of their extreme eusociality. Um, so we did some RNA sequencing and some single cell RNA sequencing. Sorry, let me just get the laser pointer out. There we go. Some RNA sequencing and some single cell RNA sequencing. And while we were able to identify interesting biological pathways and some genes of interest, we really couldn't pinpoint the DNA sequences or the parts of the genome responsible for this adaptation. Um, and as a matter of fact, despite lots and lots of really incredible work being done on the naked mole rat, only a handful of traits really have a genetic sequence assigned to them. Um, and these traits are all uh, sequence, or these sequences, I should say, are all protein coding sequence uh, related changes. And why is this? Well, one reason is because the current commonly used reference genome for the naked mole rat is based on whole genome shotgunning of short reads. So I'm sure everybody's sort of familiar with this workflow, but basically the issue is that the short read-based assembly is um, the reads and then eventually contigs are too short to meaningfully span repeats. So rodents tend to be about 40, their genomes tend to be about 40% repetitive, meaning that this assembly is split into thousands of individual contigs and genomic analysis in, um, you know, um, sorry, in regulatory regions, in looking at structural variations, looking at duplications, um, it's very challenging. Analysis is really best suited for coding regions. Um, but we know that a lot of these evolutionary changes that lead to these extreme adaptations uh, tend to live in regions involved in tandem duplications and non-coding adaptations, like changes in enhancer regions or DNA topologies. So, what we wanted to do was to build a genome assembly and annotation that is of such quality that we can start mapping these extreme adaptations back to a DNA sequence. So the first, um, so I guess what we ended up doing was building a genome assembly um, rather than being based on short reads is based on long reads. Um, so at the time we used this um, Oxford Dano pore based assembly using the R9.4 technology. So each one of these individual reads are an extremely highly accurate at a base pair level, but they're long enough to span um, common repeats found in the genome, like line elements. Um, a secondary thing to keep in mind is that we have, and Nick and Morats have diploid genomes. So really there's two assemblies in every one of our cells, um, our maternal haplotype and our paternal haplotype. So what we did was that we took advantage of a trio bidding approach where, um, based on Kamer or using Kamer based assignments, we can take um, short read sequencing from the parents and assign each individual long read to their haplotype of origin. We can then assemble two genomes simultaneously. Why is this important? Well, there are a number of base pair and structural variations between individuals, which means there's those variations between your haplotypes. And these um, sort of equally real um, haplotypes lead to pretty substantial assembly errors down the road. So even though you might be thinking, well, this is you know maybe a couple thousand base pairs, what's this gonna do in the grand scheme of things? These regions tend to do a lot in the grand scheme of things um, from the perspective of like computationally assembling a genome. Um, 
So for the assembly aficionados, just a really quick summary. Basically, there's three assemblies that exist for naked mole rats. There's this 2011 assembly. Um, in 2020, uh, group Zhu et al. did a little bit of high C sequencing, a little very low pass uh, pack bio sequencing to try and um, combine these contigs. So it's still a short read based assembly, but so the ends have been fused together with these data. Um, and then we effectively followed the vertebrate genome projects pipeline. Um, and I guess we should also mention that we perform short read sequencing in the same animal to polish the assembly and improve the individual base pair accuracy. So what do we see? Well, um, these plots might be familiar to some of you, but these are a genome-wide high C contact map. So the idea here is that high C, which is genome-wide DNA-DNA contact mapping, can often um, do a good job of showing how well your assembly has been constructed because intrachromosomal DNA tends to bind to interact much more than interchromosomal DNA. And even within a chromosome, DNA in close proximity are in much more likely to be in physical contact. So if you see these sort of like brighter red spots, these should sort of under an LB distribution be in close proximity. So we get these boxes representing each chromosome. We have 30, which maps a naked mole rat karyotype. And we see some heat along this diagonal. So sort of at a very surface level, this looks good. But we're able to take advantage of the fact that our assembly is diploid and aligned our maternal and paternal haplotypes together and saw that there's a lot of intrachromosomal misassemblies. So what we want to see um, in this genome my dot plot is something like chromosome X, basically a nice diagonal line showing that each haplotype, that chromosome agrees with each other. Um, but what we see in a lot of chromosomes is something more like chromosome two. So these bits of the diagonal line suggest consistent assembly. This bit in the middle is a problem. So what we did was that we went back, um, basically back one step. So um, this is sort of an overlay of our high C data with this tool called 3D DNA, where it assigned blue boxes, which are chromosomes, and green boxes which were boundaries where it wasn't certain of scaffolding based on sort of low amounts of high C data or low high C contact in that area. So we took these green boxes and we took advantage of evolution in a collaboration with Dr. Jing Tao Li Lu at Ojiang um, University to uh, scaffold our assembly. So took the American porcupine genome, which is a really high or well scaffolded, very complete genome, part of the vertebrate genome project. And basically the idea is that you map these fragments of our assembly to this relatively closely related high confidence um, other species. And based on where our fragments align, we can order our fragments within a chromosome. So we basically just stick five base pairs of gap in between and fuse these guys together. Uh, fortunately, in November, a uh, Larsen's in situ hybridization or fish karyotype of the naked mole rat genome was also published. So we are able to have basically markers of physical contact between our assembly and this karyotype, letting us do things like place centromeres, which is effectively impossible to do with the data that we have. So um, very pretty slide, too much to go through with the time we have, but this is what our assembly looks at. Like um, just focusing on chromosome one, we, um, basically took advantage of these physical information and this evolutionary information to build an in silico karyotype of our assembly. And we were able to do what's called chromosome painting to say that, for example, this part of our assembly matches up to you know, chromosome three on the mouse. This part of chromosome one matches up to chromosome eight on the mouse. Um, we did all the alignments with the American porcupine, but we painted with mouse because it's a genome that people are more familiar with. So going back to aligning our haplotype now in this paternal um, head class of the mole rat V3 version and paternal, we now see this really nice diagonal line. Um, we were interested to see if maybe this is just we screwed up and made up for our screw up, or if this is something that um, might be characteristic of, of genome-wide high C um, assemblies or high C scaffolding. So we took that 2020 assembly and aligned it to our um, new sort of evolutionary karyotype resolved genome, and also saw loads of structural misassemblies, suggesting that these high C data are quite good at binning chrome contigs into chromosomes, but there are some issues when scaffolding those chromosomes. 
or when ordering within those chromosomes. And I can talk about reasons why in the question. So um, as a very high level assembly, um, very high level summary of the mentioned mole rat, um, we can see much more contiguity um, in the assemblies that used high C data. Um, but what we can really see, and that's sort of quite striking, is this 750 fold decrease in gaps between our long read based assembly and the short read based assembly, which is somewhat intuitive, as we know that these reads are inherently unable to span about 40% of the genome um, and was very promising for assembly. So, again, not going to get into this in too much detail, but we have our assembly. Now we need to know where everything is if we want to make use of it. So, we can analyze the DNA sequence to find, for example, gene structures. You know, if it looks like it has a promoter sequence and exons and introns, um, it's probably a gene there. Um, my PhD lab completed a massive amount of um, functional data, so RNA sequencing, chip sequencing, attack sequencing, TTCF, um, I guess it's a shit, um, to functionally annotate the naked mole rat, and I am exclusively a computational biologist, so this was a huge amount of work done by lots of people. Um, and we can also take advantage of syntony. So for example, say these regions align in the mouse and the mole rat, we know that the mouse has genes A, B, and C, the mole rat has genes A and C, and we cannot call this gene, but we know there's a gene structure there. Really, really highly likely that this gene is gene B. Um, so going back to that, okay, well, we have this new assembly, we have this annotation, and we did some RNA sequencing and single cell RNA sequencing. Does our assembly help? Um, so this is sort of a very basic QC plot um, comparing the 2024 and 20, or our assembly and the 2011 assembly um, to some our single cell RNA sequencing data in the hypothalamus that we have. And basically we found like a 10 to 15% increase in yield of the number of genes being, or number of reads being counted and a 10 to 30% increase in yield in the number of genes being protect, detected in our single cell data. So for those of you who know the price of single cell data, that is a pretty substantial increase in yield just by updating the assembly. And these are most likely to be regions that are difficult to aligned to and are based on these tandem duplication idea, um, probably pretty interesting. So it's not like we're just adding a bunch of random stuff. Also, um, speaking of those tandem du duplications, I was interested in finding genes that have tandem duplications that could potentially lead to adaptation in the naked mole rat. So what I did was I took a universe of genes that are typically one-to-one -one orthologs between rodents. Um, I use this tool called Bicer to identify segmental duplications within the naked mole rat and uh, shrank that um, sample space to what should look like a tandem duplication. So within 100 kb, so relatively close. I wanted these tandem duplications to have functional evidence, so unique reads should be able to align to them um, using a dot plot. So a second type of um, yeah. So using a dot plot, I wanted to see one-to-many mapping from the mouse to the naked mole rat. And then lastly, by realigning our nanopore data um, to these regions, I didn't want to see any evidence of a misassembly. For example, like a massive pileup of reads um, that should not be there. So by doing this, we've created a short list of tandem duplications that look quite high confidence. Um, this is a very conservative list. I use pretty stringent cutoffs. Um, and we're now sort of going through these regions and looking for functional evidence to suggest whether the tandem duplications also have differences in regulation, um, which I can also talk about in the questions. So moving forward, you might be thinking, this is great, but mice and naked mole rat are pretty evolutionarily distanced from each other. To say that something is in the naked mole, or in the mole rat and not the mouse does not say it's mole rat specific. And that's a very good point. Um, so what we're interested in is looking at all of the African mole rats. So they are this really, really interesting and quite unique family of animals. Um, they all have a subset of the extreme adaptations that the naked mole rat has. Um, but crucially, those extreme adaptations separate from phylogeny. What do I mean by this? Well, the naked mole rat, heterocephalus flatter, lives for a very long time, is highly eusocial, and is cancer resistant. Okay, we can do that. The Demerlin mole rat is also lives for a very long time, cancer resistant, and um, not as eusocial as the naked mole rat, but highly eusocial. There's this evolutionary intermediate here, which are very short-lived and solitary, and we think cancer prone. 
which means that we are able to separate, for example, cancer resistance from speciation, which is a very, very unique and interesting opportunity. Well, pretty unique. There's a few other examples. Um, so we've been collaborating with Dr. Nigel Bennett and Dr. Daniel Hart at the University of Victoria. Uh, they basically write the book on this stuff. They get to choose what's a species, for example. Um, and they are sending us samples um, for multiple tissues, multiple samples for each of these species on Friday. Um, so moving forward, we are thinking about the next generation of vertebrate genome assembly. So, you know, if you think of long reads as that third gen sequencing, this is sort of like 3.5 gen. Um, so for each of these animals, they're naked mole rat, um, common mole rat down here. Um, we're gonna have hi-fi um, sequencing completed, nanopore with the new uh, R10 technology, so more accurate and longer reads, and the nanopore ultra long reads, which should let us span things like centromeres and hopefully get close to a telomere to telomere genome for the, each of these mole rats. We're gonna, of course, complete haplotyping. With the naked mole rat, we have the parents still present, so we'll do a trio-based haplotyping. Um, we cannot phase our, um, or we cannot take a trio approach to these other mole rats because Daniel and Nigel are literally pulling them out of the ground and sending them to us, sending them to us. So we're gonna complete phasing with hopefully high C data and definitely with the long reads. Um, we're gonna be comparing what are the best um, whole genome assembly based approaches um, and then completing a consistent assembly pipeline for these mole rats. And then finally complete a considerable amount of functional annotation on their kidneys, livers and muscle, which is the tissue we're getting. And with this all said and done, we hope that we will be able to develop a pan-genome graph for these African mole rats to find tandem duplications and um, non-coding regions that can help identify these sort of array of adaptations in these animals. So with that, I'd like to thank my PhD lab where this all got started. Um, there's a huge number of people working on this project. I'm just showing names of people who made data contributing to these slides. There really is a lot going on. Um, I'd like to, of course, thank the labs I live in now, Dr. Jared Simpson and Dr. Melissa Holmes, as well as Kansai and Ontario Genomics, who have um, graciously helped fund this project and fund my postdoc. Of course, those groups are quite high to Torbug as well, and some of the many collaborators who have helped on this work. Um, thanks. thanks.